All right. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Happy New Year to everybody. Hope you're all doing fantastic. Uh, with me today is Arnaud, uh, based over in Europe. I'm based over in the United States. Uh, Arnaud, how are your holidays? Happy New Year to you. Oh, I can't hear you, Arnaud. I think your mic might be muted. Better unmute. There we go. Uh, yeah. Yes. Happy Happy New Year, everyone. Um, very nice holidays. Uh, eating, sleeping, playing video games. Uh, Excellent. That was cool. What, uh, what what games are you playing these days? What are your favorite games? Uh, I played Mass Effect 3. So I okay. nice. finished uh, Mass Effect uh, Legendary Edition on PlayStation 4. Oh, nice. I uh, actually picked up a new, it's like a new remake version of the old game Oregon Trail. If you remember oh. that one. Um, they've they've remade it, all new graphics and like <laughs> way more adventure and things like that. It's a lot of fun to, uh, to yeah, yeah. Experience. And so you have more graphical content when you died of terrible disease, <laughs> of and... dysentery. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I haven't yeah. played this game. I have just seen it on US TV shows because in mm -hmm. France we were not playing that game. Well, yeah, no, sure, but it seems it was played by many uh, pupils in school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I I remember playing it like long, 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 long time ago. Uh, and Arnaud, his whole back wall there is full of uh, 1980s memorabilia, uh, lots of Lego and He-Man and all kinds of uh, Ninja Turtles and all kinds of fun stuff on that shelf behind you. Um, every time I'm on a call with Arnaud, I'm always looking in the background going, what kind of new stuff have you got back there? <laughs> so yeah, Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the live stream. Uh, I'm Ian Douglas. I'm a senior developer advocate here at Postman. And uh, I've been at the company about a year now. And we're kicking off our 2023 live stream. And we wanted to kind of walk everybody through like how to get started with API design in Postman starting from nothing. So uh, Arno is going to be kind of talking us through the different sections of what goes into open API. Uh, Arno, give us some background on who you are and how you got into like API design and kind of your role at Postman. Yeah, so hello, everyone. Um, Arnaud Lores, who I'm French with my typical French accent. Uh, I joined Postman uh, almost a year ago. Uh, I've been working on creating, uh, connecting pieces of software for a very long time. And I created many APIs, had people create many APIs, and I joined Postman to work on first open API. And now I'm working on API governance. So I'm studying the space, uh, how people struggle, um, uh, solve the challenge of designing APIs at scales. And I'm trying to uh, share my experience, the stories, and also help the people uh, creating Postman to uh, add API governance uh, features that will help you uh, design APIs more efficiently. Awesome. Good deal. Yeah, uh, so Arno started with Postman uh, shortly after I did. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's great to learn with Arno. We actually did a live event last June in San Francisco. Um, if anybody remembers Space Camp, which we now call Intergalactic, um, Arno and I actually did a live presentation of this is what Open API is, and we walked everybody through a specification. And it was basically an all day event. And what we're doing today is we're going to kind of condense that down into a 90 minute session here where we're going to talk about like what are the main components of writing an API design using Open API. And so Open API, um, Arno, would I be accurate in saying Open API is like, it's like a definition of a specification of like, this is what we want our API to do. We're not actually 
coding the API, but we're designing that API as far as this is what we want it to be. This is what we want our paths to be, and so on. Is that an accurate description of Open API? Yeah, yeah. The the um that that's right. The uh, the Open API specification is a format that allows to describe uh, HTTP based APIs. Mm -hmm. So basically, you will use it you can use it when you are designing your api to describe what you want to do uh, how your api uh, should look like uh, mm -hmm. it can also be used in uh, other situation you can use it to configure api gateways you can use it to generate codes uh, you can generate it from code you can generate it from uh, tra uh, network traffic if you want to reverse reverse engineer your, API, your apis uh, you can do that uh, mm -hmm. So it's machine readable format, so you can do many things with it. But it also uh, it is also usable by humans. So and that's we will uh, what uh, Jan Ayan will do uh, today. Yep. Awesome. Well, before we go too far, one thing that we like to do on our stream is a segment called "In Case You Missed It," and what we're going to be doing is we're going to talk about like new features and things like that, or new new th things that we've been building as a Postman team that we want to draw attention to. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share my screen here. Um, we have this link, and I'll post this in our chat for everyone. Um, and this link is basically our release notes. And I think we might have talked about this before, um, but one of the things that we want to kind of draw attention to, I'm just going to close chat here for just a moment on the screen, is uh, we have the automatic refresh now for OAuth 2. So if you're using OAuth inside of Postman, where you're using OAuth credentials to actually communicate with an API, sometimes that OAuth token would give back a refresh token. So you have your access token and a refresh token. And now Postman will actually take that refresh token. And when it tries to make an API call, if that uh, API comes back and says like, hey, your credentials are no longer good, Postman will automatically use that refresh token now to go get a new access token and a new refresh token for you. And we'll do that automatically. Where in the past, you had to manually say like, oh, that stopped working. Let me go in and click a button to refresh that token. Now we're going to do that automatically for you. Um, and so there are some settings in there. Um, there's a, basically a little checkbox or a button that you can activate to say, I want to automatically refresh that token. That's, um, that's a really nice feature. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so nice not having to do that manually anymore, for sure. Um, and then another thing that we want to uh, kind of bring to everyone's attention, Joyce has spent a lot of time uh, building out this uh, 15 days of Postman. So if you're familiar with the 30 days of Postman challenge that Joyce built, uh, Joyce has a new version of this, but it's a 15-day challenge, and it's specifically around testing inside of Postman. So if you want to spend some time uh, uh, actually testing out an API, then Joyce is, has a new challenge for you. It's, it's about two weeks long, and it's going to walk through like how to write tests in JavaScript to test out APIs. Um, and so uh, I'll drop that blog post in our chat here as well. And uh, you can go check that out too. Um, and so you can actually, uh, you can make a, a fork of Joyce's work and you can basically work through those challenges at your own pace. Um, if you do one every day, it should take about two weeks to get through. So that's in case you missed it. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're basically going to be building out a brand new API inside of Postman and we're gonna basically build it from scratch today. And our is gonna talk us through um, how we sort of wanna think about what goes into an API design. And then we're actually going to build out that API uh, from, from nothing. So inside of the Postman interface, I'm using mine in dark mode right now. Um, and what I'm going to do is uh, here in the context bar on the side is I'm going to click on APIs and I'm going to go up here and I'm going to build a new API. And from here, let's see, how do we want to get started from here? Um, we'll build out a new API. And it, it will allow us to connect to um, uh, like a code repository like GitHub or Bitbucket and so on um, if you already have an open API spec. And it's, in this case today, we're going to continue without a repository, which is a link down here at the very bottom. Uh, our pictures are kind of covering it up, but there is a link at the bottom of the interface that says continue without a repository. Uh, but let's give this a name. Um, Arno, what kind, of, uh, what kind of API are we going to build today? Uh, so we can talk about uh, bookshops, book, 
So uh, okay. let's the bookshop API. So, so, so uh, one thing, yeah, one thing which is really important regarding what we will do now, uh, describing an HTTP-based API, uh, talking about get slash this and post slash that. Uh, before doing that, you have to think about why you are creating an API, what it is supposed to do, talk with the various stakeholders about what, what the API is, what problem the API is supposed to solve using natural language. And once you know what you want to do, uh, then you can start thinking about, okay, how will we represent those different operations using get slash this, post slash that? How we will model precisely uh, the inputs, the outputs, and, and so on. So it's really important to not jump directly into the get slash this and post slash that discussion because uh, you will lose possibly uh, people who are not developers because sometimes mm -hmm. you have to talk with uh, business stakeholders, business analysts, uh, uh, subject matter experts who know their stuff about what you are going to model through an API, uh, but right. they, they know nothing about the HTTP protocol and how to actually design an API. Right. So that's really important. Yep. Cool. Yeah. So understanding, so just to kind of reiterate, understanding what your business goal is um, and, and knowing that you don't have to know all the ins and outs of what an actual RESTful API is or knowing about HTTP or whether you're doing it asynchronous or, or whatever. This is just a design tool. What we're going to get into today is just the design of the high level API of this is what we want our API to be. So we're going to take the sort of the business goal of what we're doing and we're going to build out a definition of, you know, to match up with our business goals, this is what we want our API to be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and regarding the use of uh, the open API specification, so machine readable description of your API, I see an interesting description uh, question. Is this help for testing? So if this question targets open API, yes, you can leverage open API for testing because uh, you will um, describe your the available operations, the data models, the inputs, the outputs. And so you can, for instance, in a uh, postman collection, create a request and check that the output uh, is uh, OK with what you have described uh, in your open API definition. That the data model you receive uh, is okay with what you described earlier. So yes, it is useful for testing. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, so let's say that we had a re, uh, uh, a discussion with business stakeholders and that we want to uh, create uh, something that deals with book, so a book job uh, API. Okay, so we're going to continue without a repository. Um, and at this point, we can, you know, it still gives us an option to connect to a repository later on. Um, and it's going to ask for some information about the summary and the description and so on. And uh, if we continue to scroll down in here, we see a button to create the definition. So because we're not connecting a repository where we can import that definition, we're going to create this ourselves. So I'm going to click on that button. And it gives us the option, you know, do you already have a file that you want to import? Do you want to start it from scratch? And we're going to start this completely from scratch. So we're going to go ahead and click on that. And then it's asking us for a version, and it's asking us for a definition type. Um, so we've got a lot of different options here. So Arno, which uh, which option are we going to work through today? Uh, what about WSDL 1.0? <laughs> Does anybody so, still yeah. use WSDL? Uh, I've been uh, I've worked twenty years in the financial industry, so I've okay. been working with WSDLs. They use the WSDL. Uh, yeah, so the, the the list you see here is a list of different uh, API uh, description formats. Uh, we will focus today on OpenAPI, and we will use uh, OpenAPI 3.0. Know that okay. before uh, OpenAPI 3.0, there was actually not really OpenAPI 2.0, but Swagger 2.0. So if you have seen in your organization uh, people talking about Swagger files or give me your uh, API Swagger file or whatever, they are actually using uh, the Open API specification. They just need to upgrade to 3.0. Uh, most of the tool uh, you are probably using in your organization support Open API 3.0 now. 
Uh, OpenAPI 3.1 was released about a year ago, I think. Mm -hmm. right. uh, the support is not uh, there in many tools, so better stick to 3.0 for, for today in post Yeah. <clears throat> cool. And then we'll write this in YAML today? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so have you a have a choice, choice to JSON. write in YAML or JSON. Uh, personally, I prefer YAML over JSON because I don't want okay. to fight with uh, curly brackets. But with YAML, you may have to fight with indentation issues. Sure. Yep. <laughs> but it's more so, human. So it's one. It's one or the other. You either get yeah. curly braces or you get uh, indentation. So it's like it's like programming. Do you want to do Python with indentation, or do you want to use <laughs> other languages that use yeah. the curly brackets? So, all right. And and we're going to leave this checkbox blank. Um, so we're not going to use a predefined template because we specifically want to spend the session today talking about what each of these sections are and why they're used. So we're not going to use the boilerplate. We're just going to go ahead and create a blank definition here. All right. So we got nothing defined over here. Uh, so or no, where do we where do we get started with uh, building out an API? So okay, so the, let's the let's first, talk about like kind of these high level sections that we're going to need. Yeah, yeah. So with the high level sections, uh, we start by uh, formally indicating the version of the Open API specification we will use by adding the Open API property. So before in version two, uh, the format was named Swagger. So the Open API property has replaced the Swagger property. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are using 3.0, so we can set the version to 3.0.3. 3.0.3 uh, or 3.0.0 does not make really a big difference. I just prefer to use 3.0.3 because it is the latest uh, version of the spec. Uh, the, okay. uh, the third level of versioning uh, just brings a few clarification uh, in, in the documentation. It does not modify the structure of, of the, um, okay. uh, the Open API document. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the first block I usually put in an Open API uh, document is the info section. So in the info section, you can give an, uh, a name, uh, which is a title. Uh, so title is the, the name of the API. That's really important to give a name to your API and just not uh, name it API because it will set its boundary, its boundaries. And it's really important to set the boundaries of your API because if you do not do that, you will add more and more functions, more and more operations, and you will end with a big, bow, uh, how do you say in English? Big ball of mud, big ball of operations <laughs> uh, that will be very hard to maintain and for people uh, to use it, it will be very complicated. Uh, right. So yeah, so giving the right name uh, is sometimes a little bit difficult. So you may change your mind during um, the design phase, but it's really there mm -hmm. to set the limits of what your API is doing. Now, uh, when, when Art, sorry, Arno, just yeah. to, to just to clarify for folks that are watching. So when when Arno talks about like setting the boundary of the API, this doesn't actually confine or restrict the API in any way. But other people looking at this definition or other people that are using this definition in other tools to generate code or generate documentation and so on, they'll be able to look at this and go, oh, this is, this is what this definition is for. And so you do want to be very specific. You don't want to just call this API because that's yeah. not clear enough. Um, but you know, if we call this our bookshop API, that kind of is, is going to help other people reading this and looking at this understand what the boundary is of yeah. this documentation. But again, it's it's the the boundary that you as a as a team, as a company, have decided this is what we want this API to be. So yeah, yeah. just to just to clarify, everything that we're doing here is just a definition. It's it's not actually confining like the actual code that you're gonna write. Um, that's gonna be up to the team that actually Yeah, yeah. This. But it can help you later when you, you so you will create the first version of your API with various operation in, in it. And later, if you want to add new features to this API, mm -hmm. having this name will help you to decide, oh, should we add this new feature in this existing API or should we create another one? A different API, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, another thing uh, which is uh, required in the info section is the version of the API. Okay. Uh, it's actually the version of, so I said the, the version of the API. So to clarify, because depending on who said the word API, API can mean different thing. It can be 
the whole software, the actual implementation plus the API, but also just the interface that is exposed to the outside world with the HTTP okay. protocol. And what we are talking about here is the version of the interface and not the version of the implementation. So we can say, okay. oh, it's, it's version 1.0 or version uh, pretty unicorn or v1 or whatever. So version is a string. So you can put whatever you want in there. So it could be a date also. Okay. Um, you choose uh, the way that works for you to name your version. <clears throat> I have never seen that one, version 1.0. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, Should that's I just good. do like v, v, V1? I was just going to spell uh, it out for folks. That was all. Yeah. Or it's really, uh, I, I usually, I'm used to that. Uh, okay. But also, people, um, the, the two different types of versioning I've seen the most are this one and uh, the one based on dates. Okay. Um, so that's the minimal version. We can possibly add a description, uh, which is, uh, uh, it could be a very long string. It supports Markdown. Uh, mm -hmm. It's interesting in the beginning, uh, in the inception of the API, to put a description to possibly clarify what the API does. Uh, it's an API that allows to do this and that and that. So you can put, uh, when I was talking about uh, having discussion in natural language, uh, if you have no place to store that, you can put some information in there. And it will also help people uh, when they look at your uh, API documentation, which will be probably available in some internal API portal or public API portal. Uh, they can see with a brief description, what the API, how the API can help them. Uh, yeah. So you can put links, uh, you can include images. Um, so yeah, you, you can do pretty, uh, pretty complex uh, description of the API. There are even some uh, documentation tools that leverage uh, header sections that you could put in descriptions to create uh, menu sections that you could see on, on uh, your API documentation uh, sidebar. Um, yeah, so that's really the the first block uh, that we usu usually put in up an open API definition. Okay. Uh, another block that you will often see, uh, especially when it comes to deployment, so that's for later, but uh, let's talk about that now, it's servers. Uh, it explain, uh, it can be used to explain where the API is exposed. Uh, in the beginning, you probably don't know where the API will actually be exposed. Uh, but what you can do is at least uh, provide the base path uh, of your API. In a sense, yep. that uh, the, the path that will be uh, at the beginning of all of your uh, resources path. So servers is a list. So uh, for each server, you will have a description and a URL. Uh, the okay. description is optional, but obviously, if you provide multiple servers, better to provide a description for each one. Sure. We'll, um, let, we'll add this in just a sec. I just want to answer this question real quick. Will the live stream be available later? Yes. So on, on Twitch and YouTube, uh, we'll have those recordings. And I believe we're also streaming on LinkedIn right now, and it'll be available to rewatch on LinkedIn. Uh, but we put all of our live streams up on YouTube for longevity. Um, so it'll be available for a little while on Twitch and LinkedIn. Uh, but check out our YouTube channel. All of our uh, previous live streams are going to be there. All right, so we need a URL uh, at a minimum, you said, right? Yeah, yeah. So the URL can be a complete one with HTTPS whatsoever, or it can be a relative. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's a list. So you have to put a um, dash. Oh, that's right. We need a dash in there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, before URL. Um, Let's start with and that description. description. So, yeah, so description. Um, so when I initiate an, uh, an open API definition, I usually use servers to put the base path. So in Swagger 2, uh, there was an actual property named base path. Uh, it has disappeared and been replaced by uh, servers. Um, what When I design API, I always recommend to put at least in the base path the name of the API and the major okay. version. 
It depends yeah. on what is your versioning policy and so on, but it can be pretty useful. If you need later to introduce a breaking change, uh, right. you can add uh, a new API, which will be exposed on Bootstrap like V2, and that way consumer can uh, slowly but surely shift from one version to another. There are more complex uh, strategies uh, regarding versioning you can do. Um, you can use um, uh, hyperlinks and so on, or you can use uh, like Stripe, uh, a single version for everything, and you actually use, you are stick to the version you have start to use uh, and when you create your consumer, and you will still use that version forever. Right. Yeah, versioning an API is definitely really important. There are lots of different ways of doing it. I'm I'm yeah. also a big fan of just putting the version in the URI path itself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can we, use headers. We, we could do a live stream solely dedicated on versioning <laughs> and how to define it, the strategies, and how to implement it. <laughs> but that's yeah. not the topic today. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah no, the, the, someone, the, yeah, someone's well, asking if there's a if there's a minimum length or maximum length for the description nope. field. You know, you can be uh, you can I. I leverage uh, the open API uh, spec with very, very long descriptions. The only limit is uh, the tools. OK. And uh, with within the scope of YAML, if you want to do a multi-line, uh, you just start with this vertical bar, and yeah. then you just indent everything after that. So if we wanted this description to also be really long, we would put a vertical bar, and then we would indent the description. And we can have a multi-line description in here if we wanted to. Yeah. So every time you will see a description property inside the Open API specification, whatever the location, it's a long description that supports Markdown. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, know that um, the base pass will be useful for your API gateways usually, because most of the time, people will leverage an API gateway to expose and secure their APIs, and the API gateway will expose it uh, using that, uh, that path. And it will allow the API gateway to know where to route the traffic uh, to the right uh, implementation. <laughs> uh, good, good, good shout out to Keith here. If we're yeah. going to debate versioning, I need to get popcorn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and hello, Keith, by the way. Um, OK, uh, the next section uh, that will be the, the heart uh, of the uh, Open API document is paths. This is the place where you will define uh, all of your path. Maybe for now, we can uh, just uh, put uh, leave it empty. So if you okay. want to have an empty path block, uh, you just have to add um, curly braces, just like when you create an uh, um, an empty JSON object that way. So because uh, in, in 3.0, paths is a um, required property. So your A open API document will not be valid without it. And uh, I use that trick to initiate really light document that have just the name and the description. And so we can start the okay. discussion and so on. Uh, another, uh, uh, another place uh, which uh, will be heavily used in open API is components. Uh, and we will do as for path, we will leave it empty for now. But uh, if path is the place where you will define all your path and all your operations, uh, you, you will have to define uh, data models, parameters, responses. Uh, you will have to use uh, security definitions. And all those elements uh, can be defined, most of them can be defined in line in the path uh, objects. Uh, but uh, it would be uh, really a burden to have to redefine again and again the same things. And hopefully, in components, you will be able to define reusable elements uh, that you will reference in path. So we will see uh, we will see that later. Okay. Okay. So that's a minimal uh, open API document. Uh, I think we can had the first uh, operation okay. and the first. We had, we had a, first. a quick question as well yeah. uh, from Santosh asking, can we have multiple URLs to get requested results? Can we have multiple URLs to get the requested so, results? 
I think if, if I understand the question right, I think they're asking, can we have multiple URLs in the server block, in, in which case we can say yes. So for example, yes. we could have uh, a description here for uh, you know, a mock server, mm -hmm. um, and then we can define that URL um, if you have you know, some kind of server set up on Postman mock. For example, um, you would have, I don't know, something like mock.postman.com. Um, you know, and you can actually define that as part of the actual definition, mm -hmm. or if you have like a development server or production server, um, you could, you could define multiple servers inside of here yeah. if you need to. Um, again, this is just a definition for other people to see that'll help build documentation and so on. It's not actually deploying anything from this. This is just defining for, for other humans to look at to say, oh, this is the expectation of what it is we want. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for now, it's the expectation. But later, it can be used for deployment. Uh, you can fill, uh, provide that file to your API gateway. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes with some additional configuration, sometimes with just server, because what the API gateway needs, for instance, is on which path should I expose this API on my side? And what is the server I have to call behind me and you can provide right. those URLs in servers and do some magic scripting on your gateway and expose your API that, that way. Yep. Awesome. Okay. So where are we going from here, Arno? Uh, first, we can create a, a simple operation to search books. Okay. Um, that way we, we will see how to create a, a first operation uh, have some uh, query parameters and describe the response. And yeah. we can also have some discussion about uh, design. Uh, so the question, how should we represent search books? Hmm. Good question. What uh, What does everybody think in chat? Should we do like slash search? Should we do slash books? Um, what would What would a typical RESTful API endpoint look like if we wanted to get a list of books or search through a list of books. Uh, so let us know in chat what you think. Uh, so we, we will make this uh, a little bit interactive. We've got some ideas, you know, between Arno and myself of how we would design out an API. Uh, but let us know in chat what you think about um, how you would define. We'll just show a uh, chat here if, uh, if folks want to throw some ideas out there. Um, how would you define an endpoint where we could search for books? So let us know what you think in chat about what kind of endpoint you'd use. Would you use like slash search? Would you use slash books slash search? Um, would you use slash books question mark search? <laughs> Get list of books. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, Arlami. Get list so, of books. That's a possibility. It is a possibility. It's yeah, not, yeah. Not a good when one. I, <laughs> uh, I've been doing some uh, many API design training sessions, and I always uh, was waiting for that kind of response. Uh, mm -hmm. slash books, bookshop and books. With oh, I see. So today we have, uh, we, we, we are in team books. Yep. So look, yeah. oh, slash books there. Yeah. We're definitely getting in with uh, lots of slash books. All right. So yeah. let's, uh, let's go with that. That, that is, that is actually a, a pretty good, yeah. Use books like a noun. <laughs> not, uh, forgetting not forgetting the, the slash. slash pretty, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> yeah. Look for books. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So it looks like. Secured list books, okay. Books search. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think we'll we'll start with slash books. As yeah, our path here. Uh, so for for those who are not familiar with the principle of REST API, uh, the idea is to take uh, an operation like search books, uh, create books, delete books, uh, order books, uh, and to represent it with a couple, which is composed of a path, which represents a resource, which is usually a kind of business concept, uh, and an HTTP method. So right. to represent search books, we will first define a resource to represent our list of books, and we decide to name it slash books. Uh, some other people could argue and say, oh, we, we should use slash book or slash book list or whatever. Uh, choose your camp, uh, choose your team. What is important here is when you do that decision, choosing between slash books and slash books, you are making a very important decision that will have impacts of all of your next 
resources because you right. decided to say when we want to represent a list of something we will use a path that ends with a noun in its plural form and so a that means if we are okay. later we want to look for uh, authors we will have a path slash authors with an s so it's really important you, you will see that every naming decision may have consequences for a future. So you have to be very careful about that. So, okay, so we are working on the books uh, resource and we need to apply an HTTP method to say, oh, we want to look for books. We want to search books. Uh, and so for that, we'll use the get HTTP method. So there are uh, roughly five HTTP methods that are used in REST API. Get, which mm -hmm. means, oh, give me that. Give me that resource. Uh, Post, which can be used usually to create a resource, uh, but also it's the uh, the fallback when you don't find the actual HTTP method that match your use case. Uh, there is put, which is there to say, oh, I want to replace that resource. Um, there is patch, uh, which can be tricky to use, uh, which say, oh, I want to partially update that resource. And there is delete. Uh, to say, oh, I want to remove that resource. And so the, the challenge is to take those uh, kind of crude verbs and find the one that will match your business operation. But in the beginning, it can be a little bit challenging, but you will see that uh, with a little bit of experience and practice, uh, it will not really be complicated. The most challenging thing is really to choose oh, uh, which, which resource I will create. And you have to go beyond what you see in your database usually. Uh, okay, so to search boot, we will use uh, get. Okay. Uh, know that there are works... Uh, from the people working on the HTTP protocol to create a new specific HTTP method uh, to deal with the search uh, operation. Uh, oh, which, really? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it will be called query. Uh, because with GET, we have some limitation uh, because GET uh, do not accept a request body. And sometimes you have to provide many complex parameters when you want to make a complex search or you have to provide um, uh, sensitive information uh, right. And you, and you don't want to add. You don't want to no. add that on the your URI path. Plus, yeah, the URI path is generally yeah. limited, where the body has yeah. like much larger data uh, capability. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's do a get uh, slash books, which will represent uh, search books. And so the first thing we will uh, say in this operation is the summary, which will actually describe with a very short sentence what is this operation. And and so we will do that a natural language. So this operation, search books. And if prior uh, describing your API with the open API uh, specification, you had that discussion uh, I was talking about earlier with the st business stakeholders, subject matters experts, and so on, you probably have somewhere a list of operation and search books is one of them. And that will, the summary property will help you to make the link and host, uh, especially for the people who are not uh, developers, it will help them to make the link between the discussion they had with you and the actual description of the API. And we say, oh, search books. I understand that. I don't know. I have no clue what means get slash books or whatsoever, but I see that it's search books. And so I, I agree that to find um, this operation in this API because we have uh, discussed uh, about it earlier. Okay. Um, okay, so we can start by uh, just getting all the books uh, we are supposed to see with uh, search books. So we can directly go to the responses to describe uh, what we will get. Uh, so any operation can return different responses. Each one will be identified by an HTTP status code. Okay. So for those who are familiar with the uh, HTTP protocol, what could be the HTTP status code uh, we could use to signify, hey, we have found some books for you? Let us know in chat. What status code 
would we use for success of, hey, we successfully are searching for these books? What status code should we be using here? Let us know in, in chat what you think we should use. Um, yeah. And Arno, while we're waiting for folks to send in responses here, um, is this property going to be a string or an integer? Because the, the status codes are typically integers. Um, yeah. But is the open API specification going to know the difference between integers and strings here? So it, it really depends on the parcel. Uh, you can actually, so response is an object. And uh, okay. in this object, each key will be an HTTP status code. And so okay. I see that most uh, most people propose a 200 OK. Mm -hmm. Some people uh, propose a 201 accepted, uh, created, sorry, or 202 accepted. Uh, we'll use the 200 OK, which is the basic status code people use to return a response. And so, yeah, it's better to enclose uh, the value between quotes to avoid any uh, any issues. OK. Um, yeah, so it's we will not use 201 created because it really the 201 created means we have we have accepted your request and we have created something, which is not the case here. We are just returning something, and we will not use 202 accepted, which means, oh, I understood your request. Uh, I'm doing some work in the background, uh, but it may take some long time, and maybe you can come back later to see if I've, I've finished my job, which is not the case here. So that's why we will, in most cases, when you are looking for something and you are able to return the results immediately, you will use the 200 uh, OK status. So HTTP status codes are uh, grouped uh, by their first digit. Uh, so the one you will use the most uh, in API are the 2xx class. So 2xx is success. It works. Uh, we will see that consumer who make API calls can make some error. Uh, so they, they will return some of our status code, but I, I keep that for later. Uh, so the first thing we can do when we describe a response uh, is provide a description that describes in, nat in natural language what people will get uh, if everything is OK. OK. And also, just um, having that level of information is useful in early design discussion. You know, you have your needs, you start to think about, OK, we'll do get slash this, post slash that, or it will return this and that without going too deep into the uh, modelization of the data. That way, you can quickly have um, another vision of your API. And then you can dive, and we will do it now, but you can dive in a second step in, OK, what are the data? Uh, we need to define them finally. That way, you can, with those steps, you can have the discussion and the uh, arguments <laughs> uh, that are specific to each step. If you try to do everything in one shot, you will have too many arguments, and uh, it will be complicated, especially if you are French like me, and you have discussion about how do you call that in English? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, so yeah, so we will return a list of books uh, so we can describe uh, the data uh, we will return. Um, just let me search my uh, cheat notes. Um, OK, so first question. Uh, so yeah, so to describe the content of the response, we will add a content property, which is an object. And in this object, each key is a media type. A media type is a string that explains, oh, the data you will receive is about that format. There are hundreds of media types that you can find on the uh, IANA websites. Uh, so it could be a media type that says, oh, it's some JSON. This, uh, this is the one we will use. So we will add application slash JSON. Uh, but it could be CSV. It could be a PDF. It could be an image. Uh, it could be a video or whatever you need. So for now, we'll stick to application JSON. Okay. Um, again, this is an object in which we will add a property name schema to describe 
the schema of the object that would be returned. Okay. The schema is actually not the so the um, how we will describe the schema uh, is not specific to open API because now we will use another specification that is widely used uh, in, the in the software industry. You probably have used it without realizing it, especially if you have used things, uh, things such as AJV and so on. So we will use JSON schema to describe the data uh, we, we will return. Uh, for instance, if you are working with, uh, you want to work with asynchronous API, you will use the async API specification, which also leverage uh, JSON schema and other uh, data format definition. So the question is, uh, the first thing we need to say in this schema is the type of the things we will return. We are supposed to return a list of books. So should we return a list or should we return an object? Um, that's a good question. I mean, typically the output that we would expect to see would be like, the whole thing that we would typically send back in a RESTful response would be a JSON object where we have like a data component and that data component would be our list of books. Just that way we can have other keys if we need like a status message or, you know, some other identifier, but then we would have like a data component or something like that, that then would be our actual list of books, as opposed to just returning a list of books. Uh, we may want a little more flexibility here. So I would typically be defining like, uh, a whole data structure where one of those components is going to be the list of books and that yeah. book list could be empty but that way we could have like you know a total count of you know we found 500 books but we're only giving you the first 10 um, and so then our data list is just the first 10 we can introduce some pagination of you know if you've got like a like a, a database cursor or something to go fetch the mm. next 10 that could be another key you know things things along those lines yeah, yeah. So that's really important when you are uh, designing a REST API. Whatever you are doing, you will always return an object. Sorry. Right. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Sorry. I want to want to answer this question real quick. How is Open API different from REST API? Mm -hmm. um, so Open API is just a definition for building a REST API. So we're just defining what we want the actual API to be. Um, and we're defining it as a RESTful API. So it's it's not it's not that they're different, it's just one is leading to the other. Yeah. It's just the, the blueprint. Open API can, uh, an open blueprint. API good, document good is the blueprint of your REST API. Okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so really important, you will always return an object, never a list, uh, never just a string or an integer or whatsoever, always an object, because as Ian said, you can add other information, especially for lists, uh, everything that deals with counts, pagination, and so on. Uh, if you want to add things later, you can add them without breaking your contract. Because if we had right. just written a list uh, and realized, oh, we need pagination, how do we do that? How do we add information right. about pagination? We can't. We can't without say, oh, you know what? It's not a list anymore. It's an object. So you have to update your code. Now you have a break and change. Yeah, exactly. It becomes complicated. Yep. And that's where so you might change like your whole major version of your API because, you know, it's not going to be backward compatible and, and so on. Uh, yes. Yeah. And that's what we call our breaking change. Yeah. And in, you and trust me, you don't want to introduce breaking changes, especially if you have thousands of consumers. Yeah, makes if, for a much better user experience for sure. That's yeah, something yeah. that we, if, we talk a lot about within Postman. If you are the only consumer of your API and you uh, you own the code of the consumer, or you can break anything like you want, but uh, if there are two consumers which are in other teams uh, that you don't know them, and these people have other priorities, you cannot break their code so, uh, so easy. Uh, okay, so let's return an object so we can add type object. <clears throat> so know that actually when, uh, uh, no, it's type uh, object. Uh, we, we are not, uh, it is not required to say that uh, this, object, this 
uh, schema is of type object, but I just prefer to state it explicitly. Uh, and so this object will be composed of properties. So we had another level uh, named properties. And so we will define all the properties available uh, in this object. Uh, so you are uh, willing to use uh, to encapsulate the list uh, in something named data. So let's uh, let's use that. So there are two two teams uh, here regarding how to name the property that that will enclose the list uh, using a generic name like data or items or whatsoever. Uh, I was in items team before, but um, now I prefer to use data but because you can also use it when you are retrieving a single element, but that's another story. The other option would be to say, oh, we are returning books. So let's name this uh, books instead of data. The problem with that is that later, if you return authors, the list will be in authors. If you are returning uh, prices, the list will be in prices. So there will be this tiny difference between your list of elements. So the more you will be generic, the better. Every time you can be generic, be generic. So if you, and that way you can say, for all of our API in our organization, when we return a list, we will return an object and the list will be enclosed in a property named data. That way, whatever you are retrieving, you know that, oh, I will get a list in a property named data. That's it. Okay. And that way on the consumer side, uh, they have, uh, they can, uh, they don't have to adapt their code depending on what kind of element they get. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so then our, so our data, our data element then is going to have a data type of some sort. Yes, right? exactly. So okay. it is a list. Uh, so we need a type. And uh, so, yeah, to represent uh, a list, we have a type name array. And this array uh, will be a list of something. And this thing will be defined in an element called items. So uh, as you can see, we have several levels. So we had the schema. Uh, which is in the at the response level, uh, if I'm correct. Uh, we said, oh, it's an object which has properties, uh, a property which is named data, which has a type, which is an array. So at each level, we actually have a, a JSON schema of something. Okay. And we will now describe the JSON schema of each element which is in the data array, uh, so in items. So we'll have another properties to say, OK, this is an object that contains properties. So again, when I was saying you will never return uh, a list but return object, when you return a list, never return a list of string. Because we could say, oh, we are just returning the title of the books because we just need the title of the books for now. But later, someone will say, hey, maybe we need if the you price. Want to expand of the books. it. Again, it's um, a breaking change, yeah. You will have introduce a breaking change. So always possibly avoid to have uh, in your design list of uh, strings, integers, and so on, because you will probably need to expand them later. Uh, OK, so wha what are the information that could be interesting um, for people to get uh, about books? Um, I'm guessing, uh, well, other the title of the book, maybe the author of the book, um, number of pages in the book, maybe? Maybe, maybe. Uh, the question is, uh, so when, when you are, so usually when I design API, uh, I do not start by the uh, search operation. I start by, Imagine uh, thinking about the concept I'm working on. So here we are working on books. Uh, okay. I start by defining, okay, what are all the possible properties of a books? So you have pages, the authors, which is also can be a, a dedicated resource and so on, but what are mm -hmm. all the properties? And when it comes to use that big uh, set of data in a list, I'm thinking, I'm asking one question. Do we actually need to return all the information mm. in a list? 
The question is usually no. Sometimes it can right. be yes. It really depends on, on your context. But most well, of this... the time, you will use a subset. And, and this is also a fundamental issue with RESTful API is you're either overfetching data yeah. or you're underfetching data. It's like, oh, I expected to have the price of the book or the ISBN number of that book and you didn't give it to me. So now I've got to come back and fetch that. Or all I wanted was the title and you're giving me, you know, 50 other fields of data that I don't need. And, and that's the fundamental issue with REST is do we overdefine or do we underdefine? Uh, because if we underdefine, then we have to make more RESTful paths to go fetch the other data that the user might have been looking for. And this is where technologies like GraphQL kind of came in and said, well, why don't we let the end user pick which fields they actually want to get back? But we're designing this yeah. out as a RESTful API. And so we have to make that decision of do we, do we give the user more information than we think they're going to need? Or do we give them a minimal amount of information knowing that they might have to come back and hit our API again and again and again to get all of the different pieces of information? And this is where as a team, you really want to sit down, you really want to think about what's the intention behind this endpoint and what data do we want you to expect to get back with this endpoint? So we've had, we've had several things kind of come back in, in chat, like the title, the description, the price, the mm -hmm. genre of the book, the author name, you know, things like that. Yeah, and, and just uh, about the um, GraphQL stuff and selecting thing, uh, fields uh, in REST API. So it's possible to have a field selection in REST API. Uh, you can use your own recipe by providing parameters saying, oh, I want the list of books and I want both parameters. Uh, there is a format called uh, JSON API. So if you go on jsonapi.org, uh, you will see a description of that format that allows to uh, by using specific uh, pattern in query parameters, to select to say, oh, I want to get those specific fields. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are work, if you have to work on REST API, no worries about underfetching or overfetching. Yeah. Uh, you will usually uh, quickly decide, decide, okay, these are the, this is the subset of that I will want to return. And if you forget one, it's not that complicated to add it because right. all you can add is not a breaking change. Um, and uh, yeah, and if you really need to tweak uh, uh, the, uh, the information you get, you may think about create a GraphQL API. Uh, maybe in the beginning, it could be uh, a backend for, for, for frontend uh, built by the team who actually need that specific uh, right. uh, tuning. Or you may decide to actually build, uh, at least for reading, a GraphQL API because for modification, GraphQL can be uh, uh, not complicated, but yeah. it's not really made for that. Uh, but these, these are the kind of discussion you will have before diving into OpenAI. That's before why actually, it's really yeah. important to have a discussion before to discuss what are our needs from a business perspective, but also from a technical perspective because sometimes right. the business needs will have uh, not technical I, I don't like the word technical because the business can be technical but it can have implication of on the architecture of the solution the right. the type of API you will create how you will implement it uh, the right. server architecture and so on so you really have to have that discussion before so you know the need, the business needs you have to fulfill the uh software implication impacts that they, right. they may have, and then you can make the decision on the tool you will use. It's really important to make decision based on uh, a rational. So um, speaking of, of tooling, so we, we've got a handful of questions here that I, I'd like to get to. Yeah. So uh, Orlando's asking, what's the difference between generating documentation in this API interface versus the collections? Uh, the nice thing about defining it as part of the open API spec is you can use that specification file to then go use other tooling if you need to that can generate like full documentation or so on, as opposed to defining that as part of your collection. You've got one place for it. If you build it in a Postman collection, it's kind of sitting in that collection if you design it and, and define it as part of the open API spec, you've got that and that is now your source of truth. And you can use that file, you know, in, in many other places where maybe they they can, uh, you know, those other tools can also extract those uh, descriptions and so on. So that would be the, the primary difference there is, is like you, you've got one place 
where you're defining all of this and it'll kind of propagate within Postman. It'll propagate out to those other areas. Um, but this way you don't have like, you know, you've got some of your work over here and some of your work over here. You've got it all in one place by putting it in the open API spec itself. Um, another question we had, um, how does open API impact DevOps decision makers? Um, that's actually a good question. Arno, do you have, uh, do you have any thoughts on how defining an open API spec could help in a DevOps side of things? Um, so regarding the DevOps, uh, if we're talking about deployments, compilation, and so on, uh, the open API document can be a really useful artifact that will be shared. It will be owned by the team who creates the API, but they can share it with many different people, especially the people managing the gateways, uh, all the people working on security and so on, because they can use, so I was talking about deploying API, API gateways, you can leverage open API if you want to do some uh, static security checks to uh, be sure that uh, nobody expose, uh, uh, let's say, backing cards numbers for APIs, you can uh, use that contract to do, to do so. So it's really an artifact that can be leveraged by all the tools uh, in your CI, CD chains, deployments, uh, and so on. All right, so let's get back to our, our definition of like, what are we going to return with our book here? So, um, you know, for the sake of time, we got about 20 minutes or so left here, yep. uh, 20, 25 minutes. So which fields do we want to define here for returning this list of books? Okay, so let's go with the classic uh, book uh, title, uh, author, and there is the question of an ID. Okay. Uh, so the title will be a, a basic string. We can say it's a type string. Uh, the author, it could be an object uh, with a first name, last name, or we'll keep, as we don't have uh, too much time, we can just say it's of type string. Basically, an author will probably be a more complex object uh, with a first mm -hmm. name, last name, and so on. And there we could have be multiple ID. authors. That's, that's, yeah, that's and a whole also there can be multiple you know, authors. Deep dive we could do. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We'll say for now these the books in our library are just going to have single authors. We'll just put yeah, a single yeah, author in there yeah. as a string. Okay. Uh, and we have the question of the ID, the property what we that will help to identify a book in a unique way. So we have two options. Uh, we could use the ID. Uh, that is our, in our book table, we have a sequence uh, which is incremented every time we insert, we add a book in our table. Uh, that's an option. Uh, but maybe, I don't know, Ian, if you have another ID. But um, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm just looking for if I have a book handy here. I mean, there's, there's typically like, a, like an international book number. Uh, we call it an ISBN number. Um, uh, you know, so lots of, lots of choices here again, or, you know, if, if we were to use the database ID, if I use a relational database, it's probably going to be an integer. If I use a NoSQL database, it may be like a UUID, like an actual string of some kind, uh, to reference that document. So again, the, the data type here that you want to use could actually be impacted by the implementation of what your team is actually doing. So. I think we need to think a little more high level about what we want this ID to be. Let's stick with maybe that ISBN, you know, more like yeah. globally accepted, like this is an identifier for this particular book. Yeah, yeah. So it's really important when you choose identifiers for your uh, business objects to always use the most known ones and possibly the most interoperable ones. So if we are using uh, our internal database ID, uh, this ID will be only known by us. But if we are using an ISBN, uh, if we provide an operation that allows to retrieve information about a specific book, anyone having an ISBN can use this operation without even thinking about it. But if we have to find the matching between an ISBN and our internal ID, they, they will have to uh, do... Uh, uh, another step before finding the information they need. So every time, always think about, okay, are we choosing the ID, the identifier, that will be the most interoperable and use this one. 
Even if in the code that means, oh, we, we have to modify our request and so on, and we have to add an index to make this performant and so on, unless there are really big issues that make the thing very complicated or not complicated, but uh, causing performance issues on your side. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a possibility that you expose that internal complexity to the outside while using your internal IDs. Right. But you, are, you will have to provide the operation that help people make the, the transition between internal IDs and ISBN. That's a possibility. But whenever I had that discussion, I always tell people, but you have convinced me that you actually cannot solve that problem internally. And most of the time, oh, no, it's okay. We just had to put an index on the database. Right. So that's really important. An API is not there to show how your system works. An API is there to solve people's problem from mm. their outside perspective. Uh, so an ISBN is a string. So it will be a type string. And so the question is, this ID, should we name it ID or ISBN? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, that's that's a good point. Because uh, someone else also kind of mentioned in, in chat too that you know, by calling it an ID, it kind of implies that it's the ID from your database, um, which, it's you know, again, it's, it's again, de depending on what kind of database you're using, could go, you know, is it an integer or a string um, as well? So, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe let's just we'll just call this ISBN yeah. so that we know what that value is going to be. So every time I had to face that question uh, again, because ISBN is a specific ID for a book. When we will, if uh, if we we were to had uh, search authors, we will return information about authors, but authors don't have ISBN, right? Uh, so they need some ID to identify them, and so we will probably end having an identifier or ID property with the author ID. With the author, yeah. If we do not, if we stick that way, for books we will have the ID which is the ISBN. But for author, the ID is ID. That's a decision uh, which mm -hmm. is not really consistent. We need to be consistent. Right. So an ID in any of our objects should always have the same name. It should be ID. But in the case okay. of a book, the ID is also an ISBN. So in mm -hmm. that case, I usually recommend to say, OK, so our guidelines say that the, ident the unique identifier of an element is named ID. So we have an ID property. The content is an ISBN. But we also have the ISBN property, which holds an ISBN. That right. way, we have something which is completely generic, and people can guess how it works. Because every time I get a list, I know that the list is in the data property, and every object will have an ID, which is its right. specific identifier. And so if later I want to get that specific element, I know that I will do get slash whatever, and then we'll provide the ID, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Right. And Mana Dave brings up a great point. Uh, books before 1970 didn't have an ISBN number. Um, and so how do we represent those if that field is going to be empty? How do we find those books in our system? So these, these, are, all, these are all things that you need to sit down and, and sort of design with your team and figure out what's the capability of our API. We're not going to go down all these different rabbit holes uh, today. We don't, have, we don't have time for this. Uh, but you know, these, these are concepts that you need to sit down with as your team, as you're designing out your API to try to determine what fields do we have available? Which fields can we put into our database? How do we want to return this back to our users? Um, so someone else was asking, I think this would be a good segue into the last section here. Um, can we use a referral to a component for a yeah, book? Let's, um, let's do so, that. So let's, so let's grab this schema and let's build a component out of that and show people how to do that reference. Then, yeah, then yeah. I think we can start. So, in, in con so yeah, so what, what we have see, show here is how to define a, a schema in line. So that means if we need to reuse it later, we'll have to copy paste it, which is not a really good idea because, oh, we need to, let's say that we decide for, in the list, we, we want to return all the data we have for the books. Let's keep things simple. Uh, we will also need to, uh, when we retrieve a, a single book, to have the same data model. And if we right. copy paste it, uh, we will 
and later we had some properties we will add in one place and you not in the other. change it in a bunch of spots yeah and it that's not ideal yeah. so let's define uh, a book uh, schema so in components we will have a new subsection named schemas which will hold reusable schemas and each reusable schema is identified by a key which is usually uh, a night um, an understandable name. So let's name it book. Okay. Uh, I noticed that you put a capital B on book. Uh, maybe you, it's because you were a Java developer. No. <laughs> no? OK. No, so I, again, uh, uh, but... it, it's, uh, it's how most people do. Uh, it's mm -hmm. I, uh, as I do. But literally, schema can be written in however case you want, but just be consistent. Right. This, not, this will not be visible in the API. It's just visible in the open API definition. But that means that for all the schemas in all your open API documents, any components you will define in schemas should be uh, should use the same case. Right. So you have to define guidelines for that. Uh, OK, so in book. We basically define JSON, a reusable JSON schema. So what we can do is copy what is between line 41 and 50. So all of these properties here. Yeah. Uh, I, I would copy the full 41 line if I was you. Okay. Because that way you will easily fix the indentation. Yep. So in Postman, I can use Shift-Tab, and it'll actually... Yeah unindent or de-dent all of those sections. Together. And that's why it's really important to take the, the full first line to do not have problem. Uh, so this is our old schema of a book. Okay. Uh, note that uh, a schema can have a description. So we could have a description uh, at, um, before properties, for instance. Uh, it's optional. Uh, Sometimes it's not really necessary, but you can you can add some information about this. You can add description on title, offer, or ISBN, for instance. Uh, another so JSON schema is very flexible. Uh, you can provide information about what is the minimum and maximum length of a string. You can provide a pattern, uh, for instance, uh, an ISBN as a specific pattern that can be uh, so it's yeah min length and max length. Uh, an ISBN can be described with a regular expression. Uh, if you provide uh, integers or numbers, you can provide minimum, maximum values. Uh, for list, uh, you can say, oh, this list will have minimum uh, one element or 10 elements or whatsoever. Yeah, so you can describe many, uh, give many detailed information about each of your property. Uh, another thing which is interesting and very important to explain when you describe an object is uh, which properties will always be present. And you can do and it's not you can you do that by hiding a required property a required list. Uh, you can do that before properties. So it's a property named required which is a list and it will contain a list of the names of the property which uh, are required, meaning they will always be present when you use that schema uh, to read something, and they will always be required uh, when you use that schema as an input. So let's say that the title and VSBN are required, but not the offer, which could be strange, but it's just for the example. So now that we have defined our reusable book schema. Let's use it uh, in our list. So we can replace uh, everything that is in items. So from line 41 to 50, yes. By, so in items, we'll add a property named $ref. And the value of this property is a string, which will be the address of the book schema in the document. So it starts with a, I never know how you say it in English. You call it a hash, hash. Hash. Uh, hash, hash means we are inside the document. Slash, components. 
So we go into components on line 47 slash schemas slash book. So for, for those kind of following along, this is kind of like a path inside of our open API specification. So we're, we're saying this is where this particular schema is defined. It's defined in a section called components, which we've got here. And inside of that, there's a section called schemas, which is here. And inside of that is where we've defined the actual book schema. Um, and so it's basically just a locator. Um, and so as, as Arno was saying, the hash says it's inside this document. And then we're giving it sort of a path definition inside of here of where to go find that schema. Yeah. And know that a dollar ref can target another document located mm -hmm. somewhere else. Uh, so if we had another document name, uh, whatever.yaml, uh, at the same level of our document, we could have a dollar ref, whatever.yaml, hash, and so on. If it okay, was so, on another so if we server, had, yeah. So if we had another file, it would be like yeah. second file.yaml, and then the hash mark from there. So yeah. if you've got, um, and, and so one thing that Postman allows you to do is have multi-file specifications is you can actually specify coming from this file, inside of that file, this is the path to go find that schema. Um, and so if you want to break your components out or, or do some more logistics around like separation of, you know, this is where we're defining our books and this file defines our authors and so on, yeah. uh, you can actually uh, reference those other files uh, mm -hmm. in this way. In this and, case, and because you, it's inside of this document, we're not going to put the file name in here. We're just going to yeah, put that. Yeah. We're going to start it. With and you, you can also add a full URL, uh, so you can target a document which is located somewhere else. Oh, really? Uh, nice. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that the splitting open API document is typically done when you have huge document, but also to have uh, components that are shared across APIs. Typically, your error responses. Uh, you will always use the same structure and so on, so you can define one, it once and for all and just reference it from all of your uh, Open API documents. Okay. Uh, okay. So here, uh, what we have online from line thirty-eight to forty-one is something that says, okay, we have a property named data, which is a list, an array, which contains elements that are of type book. And uh, if we were to define uh, the creation of a book, uh, we will uh, so maybe you can close the get on line 33. Yeah, so we can have a post HTTP method, uh, a summary, say create a book. So the summary is optional, but I really recommend to put it because uh, that way that explains what the API is supposed to do. Uh, yeah, so let's describe the response first. So what we'll, uh, we'll return is a book. So we need to add a content. Oops. Uh, the media type, which will be application slash JSON. and the schema and the schema we will not redefine it we will use a dollar ref targeting uh component schemas books uh, book sorry but before giving a response uh we need to provide information in the input so we will describe the um, uh the request body Okay. So you, you will see that the request body is defined almost like a response. So in, in post, we will, uh, maybe before responses, we will have the request body uh, property. And so a request uh, body, okay. just like a response, has a content with a media type and a schema. Okay. So this would be request body, I think, like that. Is that right? Yeah. And inside, you can copy past uh, or retype it content, application, JSON, schema, dollar ref. So, regarding the request body, uh, there are two options. If there are not that much difference between what you need to create a book and what is a book, you can use the same schema. 
Uh, in our case, uh, there are not much properties, so we can use this, the same schema. If, for instance, there, there have been an ID which is generated by the database, let's let's add it on the on the book schema. Let's add okay. the ID property if it's not already there. I just want to show uh, a trick uh, which is available. So people will be able to provide the title, the author, and the ISBN. But the ID is generated by the implementation. Right. So this ID can be an integer, for instance, uh, which is not really a good ID, but not really a problem. Uh, but what we need to say is that this property will not be provided by the consumer. It will only be present when we are using that schema in a read operation. And so to state that, we can say at the uh, below type integer, we can say read only, uh, read only true. Is it capital O? Uh, yeah. Read okay. Read only true. Okay. And that means this, this property, when you look at the documentation in any uh, uh, tool that supports uh, Open API. Uh, when they see that, that means when you look at the uh, request body of post slash tools, you will only see, oh, I need to provide title or for an ISBN. And that title and uh, ISBN are mandatory. And in the nice. response, you will see, oh, there is title or for ISBN and the ID. Uh, that's not always possible. So what I usually uh, do when I design API like that is I have a uh, book create is the, my model to create a book. Book summary is the model that I use in a list and book is the model that is a complete book. Oh, so you're kind of nesting your, your components together. And I'm just defining three different components. Oh, okay. And possibly leveraging advanced JSON schema stuff, you can say, oh, a book is a book summary plus some of our elements. Or maybe a book sum or the book create plus some of our elements and so on. But sometimes it can be really tricky and it's sometimes simpler to redefine the different. Redefine. So what Arno is saying is, is we could build a component of just these fields and call that book summary and then have another component reference that and add the ID field on top of it. So you, we're not copying and pasting all of this stuff again and again. Um, but that's getting into more advanced like JSON schema stuff, as he was saying. Um, but that would be one way of sort of what we call drying this up. Don't repeat yourself uh, is, is, is a good way to, to sort of minimize the overall size of the open API schema or uh, the definition itself. Okay, so now we've got a response for that. And uh, someone was also saying in, in chat, maybe we'll do this and then we'll wrap up is uh, adding an example. Yeah. Um, so this is something that's, that's really, really helpful, especially if you're gonna use this open API schema to build a collection inside of Postman. Sometimes you want sort of predefined examples of what this uh, output is gonna look like or what a response is gonna look like or what an, uh, an input could look like. And we can actually define those examples right here in the schema itself. So um, Arno, which, uh, which of our endpoints, so we have a get endpoint and a post endpoint, which one do we want to add an example to? Oh, I think we're going to add on, on the post so that we can add on examples on the request body and response body. Uh, someone okay. in the chat was talking about adding examples on properties. So yeah, in OpenAPI, you can have examples at, let's say, two levels. At mm -hmm. really fine-grained property level, these are... And, and at schema level, I should say. So in JSON schema, there is an example property. So for each element, an object, uh, a, pro, uh, a property, you can provide an example. Mm -hmm. But we will okay. use the open API examples, which are located in responses, request bodies, and also parameters. So at this level, so let's start by responses. So at the uh, same level as schema, in the responses to one, uh, we can add an examples property, uh, which is, uh, I don't know if it's a list, uh, just checking. Um, uh, so we, no, I think it's, I think it's going to be an object. 
right? Because it, it would be an yeah. object of what our, our example is going to be. Yes, I'm just checking my cheat sheets. So I'm using a tool called the Open API Map that describes the Open API. Just checking this examples. Yes, it's an object. Uh, so examples is an object which can uh, which contain keys, each key identifying an example, and each example can contains a summary, a description, and a value. Okay. That is pretty useful when you are designing your API to provide several examples depending on various use cases, uh, and then they can be used uh, in, in, in two. So we have just one. Uh, so a value, so you describe in YAML uh, an example of a book with an ISBN, a name, and whatsoever. Uh, I know a good book. Uh, the cover is behind me on here. Uh, it's the design of web APIs. I wrote it. Uh, What's it called? The the, the design of the design web of APIs? web APIs. All right. Yeah. Oh, well, that's that's the title of the book, not the author. Yeah. I and don't remember author, the ISBN. Yeah. Uh, we'll just put something in here. So ISBNs yeah. are typically going to start with 978 yeah. or 979. So we'll just do one of these. Cool. And then we do not define an ID because we would not be defining that as uh, as part of our input. We would get that back as a response. Uh, as we are working as the... In oh, actually, the, this is the response. response so yeah. We can add an ID. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And know that we, we are defining an example in line but you can define example in components. And so if you have an example that needs to be used across several operations, you can define it in components examples and use it uh, with a dollar ref components examples and the example name. Yep. Uh, yeah, and we can define an example in the same way uh, in, the, um, in the request. So you can basically co copy past what you just type and we will remove the ID. So at the same level as schema, so you have to go back to put example, yeah. And you can remove the ID. Now we remove the ID on that one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, know that there are tools, uh, especially Spectral, that we uh, have had it in, uh, in Postman, that can do some checks to ensure that your examples match the schema you have provided. Because as you can see, uh, it's just IN typing uh, a value, and it could make a typo, uh, type ISBN with a Z instead of a S or whatsoever. And so there are tools that will be able to check that all your examples are actually valid against your JSON schema. All right. So, looks like uh, looks like that yeah. schema now passes. So we needed to add a description on the response. Yeah, yeah. Um, the description is mandatory. Uh, yeah. So what yeah. what you see here is really the uh, the essence of Open API. Once you have seen that, you're ready to 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 describe your uh, API with Open API. It's just a question of knowing when to. Uh, where to define reusable components using them and so on and so on. But the format is not that complicated. Right. Uh, we did have someone ask in chat, can we send out this file? Um, we'll actually link it. Uh, so when we finish processing the YouTube video, uh, we'll go in and we'll add a description with chapter notes and so on. Um, I'll put this file up on GitHub somewhere and we'll link to that file for you so that you can, uh, you can see that. Awesome. Well, uh, we've only got about a minute or so left, um, and, and we'd like to close our live stream with kind of a community shout out if you've got anything going on. Uh, so Arnaud, do you have anything uh, going on? Uh, any any upcoming talks or anything like that you want to talk about or anything you want to promote? Uh, I think that I want to promote uh, Postman. 
yeah, yeah. No, I, Good I was answer. really, really pleased with the V10 uh, governance feature that introduced the use of Spectral in Postman. Mm. So it's not yet available to people who do not have an enterprise account. Maybe it will, it will change in, in the near future, but that was really uh, uh, a major bump for me and really interesting feature. So a tool that I want to give a shout out to is Spectral which has been created by a competitor named Stoplight. So it's a tool that you can use to uh, check that your API definition conforms to certain rules that you decide to create yourself. And that can help you to ensure that all your properties are camel case, that you are using the right uh, error schema in your uh, error responses, that you are using uh, the expected HTTP status code and so on. Yeah, awesome. And uh, from our team, from the DevRel team, uh, again, we're going to live stream every Thursday. So again, Happy New Year to everyone. Thanks for uh, dropping by. Uh, come back every Thursday. So we stream at 8 a.m. Pacific time, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern time in the United States. Uh, we're going to try to stream every week. And it won't just be people from Postman. We're, uh, we like to have partners on the stream as well and kind of learn about their APIs and how to use their APIs. Uh, so we've got some interesting topics coming up. Uh, I'm going to be doing one on 3D printing. We're going to make a live stream inside of a live stream to watch a 3D printer do some interesting stuff. Um, so we've got all kinds of really neat stuff. Uh, so come hang out with us on Thursdays. Uh, we love interaction with chat and so on. And uh, Arlami says, what do you mean we're going to try? <laughs> yes, we're, we're going to, well... When, when folks like me don't get COVID and we have to cancel at the last possible moment, uh, we, we will be streaming every Thursday. But uh, yeah, we will get these uh, videos up on YouTube. Um, and uh, like I said, it will be available for a short period of time on LinkedIn and on Twitch. Um, but we keep all of these videos up on YouTube and we'll get those description notes and, and chapter notes written in there with a link to the YAML file that Arno and I worked through today. So Arno, appreciate your time today. Thanks for hanging out with us. Um, thanks to everybody who, uh, who came by and interacted in chat. We always appreciate that. Um, someone was asking, where can we learn about Postman in depth? Um, there's a lot of tutorial uh, information. Um, there's also a walkthrough. There's something that we call 30 days of Postman. Um, so if you actually open up Postman and you use the search tool at the top that says, uh, you know, search Postman, you can search for 30 days of Postman. And it's a 30 day walkthrough. Um, you don't have to do one every day. You can work at your own pace and you can get through the whole thing in, in just a few days if you've got the time. Um, but that'll take you through a lot of the major features of uh, the Postman product itself. Awesome. Well, thanks again, everyone. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us today. We'll catch you all next week. And uh, again, Happy New Year. And we'll catch you next time. Goodbye.